Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Uh, what are we going to talk about today? I think we'll start with fixed odds betting terminals, uh, but not in the uh, most straightforward of terms. Inevitably, I am going to overcomplicate things by asking you where the line is between responsible government and interference. And, and I want you to have a proper think about it, not just in the context of these fixed odds betting terminals, which I have probably got to put very near the top of the list of things you have taught me about. I'm still yet even... I'm a bit frightened of going to have a go on one, actually, off to some of the stuff you told me. Um, Matt Zarb Cousin is a... Is a uh, I think he was a spokesman for Jeremy Corbyn until relatively recently, but he was the fella. I didn't know. He used to ring me. He's been leading the campaign, but to me, he was just a punter. He was the first person, I think, when we first started looking at these issues. But that's a political campaign that deserves some serious credit to, to, to actually pull stuff off as a result, in his case, of personal experience. I, I remember the first time he told me how much money he estimated he'd pumped into these things and it was staggering and the, the what is it the sociological or the or the philosophical i don't know the um it's you're right richie you are one in a million well done in that tweet that just came in um you you kind of have this sense let's talk about the word ban i think that's the best way into this because stuff doesn't really get banned it's quite odd, isn't it? You know when the Mayor of London banned advertising junk food from public transport for reasons that on this programme we've understood for a long, long time. The notion of free choice is utterly meaningless if I spend a billion pounds persuading you to do X and zero pounds persuading you to do Y. The idea that your choice is free, um, well, it makes a mockery of, of psychology and advertising and everything in between. So... Nobody is going to be prevented from stuffing their faces with cheeseburgers after the junk food ads come down off the London Underground. Similarly, nobody is going to be prevented from putting 100 quid into these machines because the minimum stake, the maximum stake, has been reduced from 100 quid to 2 quid. It will just take you, I think if I've understood the technology correctly, it will just take you 50 times longer to lose 100 pounds. Which is great, isn't it? Because, I mean, it just puts a limit on how much harm people can do to themselves. You know, when you go to the supermarket and you buy paracetamol, you're not allowed to buy multiple packets of paracetamol, which is, a, I think, a, 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 I mean, I don't know how effective it is, but it's a well-meaning piece of legislation or, or convention that's designed to prevent overdose, deliberate overdose, presumably accidental as well. Where else would you look at? You see, the phrase that's often used by idiots is nanny state. And, um, and when I say idiots, I, I, I mean idiots, actually. It, it's one of those ludicrous little levers that people who are determined to get angry are fed by people who get paid a lot of money to make them angry, you know. It's, 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 yeah, it's the nanny state. It's this victim mentality. The strangest thing that's happened in British and American politics in, in the last few years is the way that the perpetually victimised have somehow cast themselves as the, as the protectors of freedoms. How could anybody get cross about a junk food ban or, or the ban on um, that, those disgusting adverts where women were being told that if they didn't have a body like a supermodel, they weren't ready to go to the beach? How can anybody get cross about that? unless they're determined to be cross all the time. This, this notion, oh, not everyone, it, it, an ear, interference. And I think, psychologically, it, it just invites people to feel persecuted. Now, I'll tell you what persecution looks like in the context of the British population at the moment. Persecution looks like being locked up in an immigration detention centre despite having lived here since you were five and having every right to be here. That's persecution. But this weird new breed of snowflake thinks that they're somehow being persecuted when the Mayor of London decides to ban junk food advertising or the government today decides to lower the maximum stake. What, what I'd really like to work out is what people are actually angry about half the time. This is an area of intense fascination for me. What are you actually angry about? Why are you so angry all the time? Well, what is it today that you're supposed to be angry about? Well, look at the front page of the Daily Mail. 
And as if by magic, I can tell you that today you are supposed to be angry about Labour's free-for-all on migrants. Rawr! Grrr! I'm furious about Labour's free-for-all on migrants. What else are you angry about today? Wow! The nanny state has interfered in the, in the flipping fixed-odds betting terminals. Do you ever play on a fixed-odds? No, but the nanny state. Down with the na health and safety, human rights. All these things are terrible. And I think, and I'm trying to knit this together for, for something that I'm working on at the moment i think it is about the commoditization of persecution persuade people who've got it pretty easy compared to everybody else that they're somehow victims you know there's even a men's rights movement now gathering pace there are people in this country that think straight white men are victims of oppression and persecution it's it's quite incredible really but it's proof positive isn't it that that it works if i tell you that someone is nicking your biscuits then i tell you who it is you don't really care whether i'm right or not or whether i'm pointing out the correct culprit you just got all these mythical biscuits in your head now where are all my biscuits oh someone's nicked them did you ever have them no but they should be mine they're my biscuits so i tell you that health and safety legislation is designed to restrict your freedom to steal your biscuits i tell you the migrants migrants are coming over here in a free-for-all and they're nicking your biscuits too and then i tell you that the government wants to nick your biscuits you should be able to eat as many biscuits as you want how can the government put limits on how many biscuits Biscuits you can eat. You can only eat two biscuits now. It used to be a hundred biscuits. It's outrageous. And now they're not even letting me look at pictures of beef burgers on buses. They're taking away my pictures of beef burgers. How can anyone get cross about any of those things when you actually stop to think about it? Answer, I really, really want to be cross. People really, really want to be frightened and angry. Because if your emotional palate is pathetic, those are probably the only feelings that you register. Fear and anger, fear and anger, anger and fear. Which leads us, somewhat improbably, towards fixed odds betting terminals. Government intervenes to stop people doing unhealthy and damaging things. What is it about these machines that, that makes them so toxic? 0345 6060973. We'll start off with a bit of that because I think we need a bit of context and background. But what I really want to get to the heart of is this sense of... <sighs> What's the word I want? Persecution is so close, but it's not quite perfect. The way that if I was a little bit more cynical, I would now be whipping people up into a state of righteous indignation about the curtailment of a freedom that they never really understood or enjoyed. Well, what is the word I want? This sense of, it's not quite persecution, harassment? I don't know what the word I want is. You, you'll come up with it during the break, probably, and I'll pass it off as my own afterwards. But the phone lines um, are about to open, and I want you to tell me, actually just on a personal level, but with some contextual reference, where, where you think government should stop and personal responsibility should start. Because I don't know. I lean towards... I, I, kind of can't really conceive of circumstances in which a government could do too much to help us to be happier and healthier. That, for me, is, is, is a key purpose of government. And yet I think that's the polar opposite of people who call themselves classical liberals or use phrases like nanny state. And I don't know why I feel like this, because I don't need much help from the government myself. I've never had a gambling problem. I drink a bit too much, but not to the, not to the point of problem. I, I kind of, I, I know what's legal and illegal. I know what's good for me and bad for me. I don't, I mean, this perhaps is where you move into the patronising middle class territory, where you say, well, I don't need any help from government in, uh, in avoiding vices. Uh, but I think that other people do. So, you know, I don't feed my children fast food, but those plebs over there, they need guidance from government. I can see why that is a slightly problematic position to adopt, but that is kind of what Christianity teaches you. To, to care for those who are less fortunate than yourself. And if you don't understand the dangers of, of, of sugar and salt and saturated fats, you are less fortunate than me. If you, if you can't um, break the habit of pouring your wages into a fixed odds betting terminal every Friday, then you are currently less fortunate than me. If you um, are uh, kind of r reduced to self-disgust, by the ludicrous advertising of improbably um, 
anatomically improbable female bodies that make you feel ugly and make you feel unloved, then, then you are less fortunate than me. And I want government to look after people who are less fortunate than me. That's probably the closest I've got to a political ideology. Of course, many, many people who are less fortunate than me uh, despise the ideology I've just described because they need to believe that the reasons why they're less fortunate than someone like me are because of the free-for-all on migrants or Muslims or whatever today's two minutes of hate is dedicated to. And that's what I want to try to unpick with your help today, OK? 0345 6060 What's wrong with the idea of government doing as much as it can to help citizens be happy and healthy while respecting the freedom of other people to fill their faces with filthy food, to um, watch as much pornography as they please and to spend as much of their income as they want on gambling? You can never stop these things from happening. But what on earth is wrong with the idea of government expending energy and resources on helping to create a happier, healthier population. And if the argument is, why do all my taxes go on that? Well, then the response is simple. In the long term, a happier, healthier population will be of much greater economic impact than an unhappy, unhealthy population. Any obvious ways would be treating medical conditions caused by unhealthy lifestyles. So you say, why are my taxes going on telling people not to eat sweets? Well, partly because we'll save a chunk of money in the long term if we can reduce the number of people with diabetes. Well, yeah, I, I can't, I'm really pleased with this, actually. I know you indulge me some mornings when I go off on a bit of a tangent, but that, that is a really interesting question. I might have to add an extra chapter to my book. What, what, what is wrong? And, and let's not argue today. Let's have an intellectual exchange. So you, you genuinely do abhor the so-called nanny state, and I'm genuinely sorry for calling you an idiot. But... What's wrong with the idea? When I pay my taxes, I think the Christian principle is that the money will be spent on people who need it. And right now, at this point in life, I don't. That's why I think taxes should be the basis for all the honours in this country. I think you should... Well, I remember Alan Sugar posted a picture of the cheque he'd sent to the Inland Revenue. That's why he should have got a knighthood or a peerage, of course, in his case. Uh, just show me how much tax you've paid as an individual, and if you cross over a certain threshold, you get an OBE. Cross over another threshold, you get, you get a knighthood. I mean, really go to town on it, and you can have a seat in the House of Lords. Because the contribution you make to the economy is immense. And what does a billionaire need with all of the things that his taxes are spent on? Very, very little. So it's, 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 it's the most fundamentally Christian of principles, income tax. To, to, to take from those with the most and share with those with the least. And I think government policy actually reflects the same principle sometimes. What is wrong? Yeah, this is the question. Um, hit the numbers now, you will get through. What is wrong with the idea of government trying to make the population happier and healthier? It's a move that promises to take a stand against gambling addiction, but at the same time could cost 20,000 jobs. The government said today that it would cut the maximum stake someone can gamble on fixed odds betting machines from £100 to just two pounds. Campaigners welcomed the announcement, but Britain's bookmakers warned it would cut their profits, forcing them to close thousands of shops. Our Scotland correspondent, Kieran Jenkins, has this. They prey on the most vulnerable, and it's going to be stopped, the government has said. The days of these casino-style machines swallowing hundreds of pounds in a matter of seconds are numbered. The maximum bet will be slashed from a hundred to two pounds. It seemed improbable two months ago. When the gambling regulator recommended a 30 pounds maximum bet, we came to Coke Bridge, North Lanarkshire, and met Martin. Before you know it, you've lost your, your 12 hours taking a hundred pounds, possibly, within minutes. Who was addicted to fixed odds betting terminals and was dismayed. But today, the government has defied the regulator and the gambling industry. It's a massive drop, isn't it? It's a massive drop. Two pounds is an unbelievable gesture. It will save people from contemplating suicide. It will save marriages breaking up. It will save so much damage. If, if there had been a two pound bet back when you were gambling, yeah. would it have made a difference? I wouldn't have played it. I wouldn't have played it. 
gamblers repeatedly lose more than £1,000 a go at fixed odds machines. It happens over 233,000 times a year, with one gambler losing £13,000 in a single session. Now, you pass no fewer than five bookmakers along this street, so there may be 20 of those fixed odds betting terminals here, taking, on average, a million pounds of these people's money each year on the doorstep of one of Scotland's most deprived communities. That's why the government's stepping in. You've seen more bookmakers open up in, uh, in areas, mainly of deprivation, um, and what you're seeing is huge losses on these machines by some of the most vulnerable in society. On the beleaguered British high street, betting shops have indeed been buoyant. But the industry now claims half of them will shut down, 4,500 closures and 21,000 jobs lost. The average betting shop, half its profitability comes from these machines. You remove half the profitability from any sector of the economy, you're going to see closures, you're going to see job losses. A duty hike on online gambling is also being planned to offset the tax take from these machines, which is set to tumble. Punters may move online too, or that money may remain in the pockets of those in places like this who need it the most. Kieran Jenkins, Channel 4 News, Coatbridge. Um, we, we will look at the detail of the fixed odds, the specific detail of the fixed odds betting terminals, but I, I am, as is my want, keen to broaden the conversation out as well into this question of what is wrong with, I mean, what is government for if not to seek to make the population happier and healthier. Here, here you go. This is the kind of objection I'm referring to. This is from the Institute of Economic Affairs. My thanks to Incorrigible FCA for, uh, for sending this to me. And also, actually, seeing as we're having a bit of a morning of patting ourselves on the back, thank you for keeping me so well informed about things. Um, many of my Twitter correspondents, Incorrigible FCA would be um, the most prolific. And, and um, because this isn't the BBC, it's just me and Beth, really, on the production side and Axel pushing the buttons, uh, we've kind of crowdsourced a lot of the journalism on the programme over the last couple of years, and, and he's very much at the front of the queue. And so here is, thanks to him, the quote from the Institute of Economic Affairs. This um, fixed odds betting terminal uh, is to deal with a moral panic over something that accounts for just 14% of Britain's gambling expenditure. There has never been any evidence to support this campaign. The government is weak and cowardly to have given into it. Says who? Well, says a sort of mysteriously funded right-wing think tank that invariably gets invited onto programmes with slightly lower standards than this one. That would be my short answer to the question. What do you want government to do with our money, if not try to make us happier and healthier and safer? Better educated? Health? Yeah, well, you tell me. Ali's in Coventry. Ali, talk to me about the machines. James, hi, oh. hi. Thanks for taking the call. Um, absolutely, absolutely over the moon with this. I, I've been in, involved in these for fixed odds betting terminals for over 10 years now. I'm now 30. Um, got a good job, worked hard through university, two degrees. Didn't think I'd ever be someone who would be addicted, you know, I'd say I'd from a good family background. Um, what happened? Gambling something that, what happened? Um, so 16, a um, couple of guys in the year above popped yeah. into the bookies, um, you know, winning money, so making, you know, 10, 20 pounds uh, with, with you know, a few notes and doubling money. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. How, you know, how are you doing that? You know, yes. going to work, full day's work, and, you know, you're making sort of uh, part-time money, and then these guys are doing it in five, ten minutes on these uh, spinning on the roulette machines. And you think, oh, that's interesting. Um, you know, you've got some savings from family, saving up birthday money and things like that, and you just sort of hit 18 and I'm in there, you know, every day after college and... Um, but surely you, know, surely you lost a lot to start with. Well, the thing is, this all starts um, with winning, unfortunately. This is how the, the big, the big, you know, the people who put the big money down like me start off. You start to win a lot. You start, there's weeks when, you know, I'd be holding, you know, uh, a couple of extra hundred pounds in the pocket off, you know, just 10, 20 minutes of spins. And um, this is how it all starts. You know, young age, you get this dopamine high. Um, this is, I, I mean, I, this, is, this is only part of today's conversation because I'm interested in the political picture as well. But, but the, yes, yes. The, the, it, and, and I know it's an illness, and that's why it is important for people like me. It would be like talking to someone who's depressed and telling them to cheer up, wouldn't it? it it's useless yes. and pointless, and it betrays deep ignorance of the actual condition. But, but I, I, what, what, how would you, because you're an articulate fellow, how would you put into words the feeling you have when you know you shouldn't do it 
but you're going to do it anyway. Oh, it's a thrill. It's an absolute thrill. And, and so, so is it, it, is it like many, having sorry. a drink then? Because if I, when I do, sort of knock the booze on the head for a while and I get around to about six o'clock in the evening when I would routine, or seven o'clock, where I would routinely mix myself a martini, or possibly not quite that sophisticated a drink, and, and, and then I have a kind of half-hour period where I resist the urge... Is that what it's like? I mean, and you're just I, I not. I can't say. I mean, I'm, I'm from a, I'm from a background that doesn't drink. You know, I'm from a Muslim background, and I haven't. You're not, you're not supposed to gamble either, Ali, mate. If we're no, going to start absolutely, splitting absolutely, that particular hair, so, you know, <laughs> I haven't. You know, and this is this is the the crux of the matter. It's so so addictive. And, but that's what I want you, you know, to put into words because I've just put into words yeah. my mild. Um, it, 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 dependency, I suppose, but I have the power to, to resist. You yeah. don't. You didn't have the power to resist. So d no, 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 describe no, the voices to me that were that were seducing you to go back in and do something you knew was stupid. I mean, I mean, the thing is, the thrill and the, the buzz that you get from winning the money um, from such little investment um, or such a kind of so quickly well, you can I mean, you can win a hundred pounds uh, on these machines within within twenty seconds. You can walk out. But, but um, nine times out of ten, you're going to lose money. No, no, no. This is the thing that people don't understand. Go you on. If you, you've got 36 numbers, if you bet on 25, um, let's say you put £100 down, you can basically make a profit, a by a small one, but, not, you know, no. not, for, you to, for you to be knocked out... Well, how much have you lost over where, 10 years? How much money do you think? I'd say, I'd say over £100,000, but I've won... But you're still telling me you can... Times when I've won. Right, and, Sorry, again, and it's because you win, you keep going back. You said £100,000 very casually there. Why would this reduction in the maximum stake make such a difference? Why, why do you welcome okay. it? What, what, what happens is that when you, when you bet, uh, let's say, 10 or £20 on these terminals and you lose, you keep on doubling your money. So you put in on a £40 stake, £80 stake, and then you go up to... When you get to the 100, you start to realise, I can't bet anymore, so I might as well call it a day. God. With the two, that, and that's been the, the main problem. Oh, you see, you're, man, you're a your genius. Losses. Got it. Yeah, I um, get it. And if you start with two pounds... And the nature of the anymore, game, the way the game is yeah. set up, you can double down and double down and double down. And, yeah, so uh, but yeah, but exactly. with a two pound maximum, exactly. you're just not going to be. You've got. I wouldn't bother because you know, for me, making a, you know a couple of pounds is not worth it. And I know that sounds sort of quite shrewd, but the thing is, James, um, you know, the way the main way I've lost money is sort of ten, twenty numbers in a row that are coming red and coming black, you know, and that, that's just a completely very low odd. But this happens regularly to someone who plays it, you know, every yes. day. You know? When did you last play? So, Oh, gosh, uh, probably about 11 months ago. Um, did, so you, doing well. did you get help, or did you just...? I, 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 I self-help, yeah, and, you know, family relationships, job... Focused, um, and so, I mean, in, I'm, I'm in, doing well. In, in, in many ways, um, this is all about people like you, and everyone yeah, else should yeah. just shut up and sit down because either you get well, it. Yes, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm paying. I'm paying. I've got a, a better job now. I've got promotion. I'm paying more taxes. My um, relationships are healthier. I know people who really, really haven't, from my background, that haven't done as well as me in terms of career, and this has taken them over to you know they haven't got out of their no, addiction, and and this is there are small there are small number compared to say alcoholism, you know, or... No, uh, no, 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 I, I get it. It's why this IEA this is huge, comment you know. is so bovine, isn't it? It's £400 yeah. million pounds that would have gone to the and Treasury and now won't. The point I'd just like to make, you Go know, on. these are not people from um, low social... But, you know, I know people who gamble who are sort of on very high salary, you know, the footballers that do it. They, this is this is people who are who are educated. They know better, but this is the severity of the problem. It's very very, it's very very toxic, and uh, I'm uh, absolutely over the moon with this new, new regulation. As, as indeed is every pretty heard. much everybody who has suffered as you have suffered from addiction. Call it what it is. Um, so. Uh, what is the problem with the idea of the government? And they haven't even spent money in this case. You could argue, as the Institute of Economic Affairs does, that it, it involves a hit to the Treasury. But I think Ali's just reminded us unintentionally that the £100,000 he's pumped into gambling machines over the uh, uh, last 10 years, the, the, the tax percentage of that, he'll just spend the money more wisely now. He's not, he's not going to keep it under the bed. The Treasury will still get its cut of that money. It will just be spent by Ali on, on wiser things, healthier things, less damaging things, non-addictive things. Um, can we squeeze in Barry quickly in Brentwood? Barry, I'll give you a minute. What would you like to say? I'd like to have more than a minute. But All right, I'd bad like luck. It's 10.28. You're listening to James O'Brien. Now, go on, Barry. Fill your boots. Take your chance while you can. All right, mate. I, what I'd like to say is, is it's the most wonderful thing what's happened this morning. Um, I've had 300 phone calls so far this morning from compulsive gamblers. And what I'm saying is, is, is that 
all these compulsive gamblers, and there's thousands and thousands, James. You don't realise because you're no. not a gambler. You're right, but I what don't. What I'm saying is, is that if you came to one of our open, I've been running it for 44 years, and now it's 15 and 16-year-olds. What are, are they addicted to? Gambling the machines, is everyone it? that's coming in, and their lo- and their families are in desperate state. You know, and only I've got a minute, but believe me, I would love you to come, and you would your hair would stand up on edge oh, because God. it's so serious. It is so serious. So uh, uh, briefly, is- Barry, how does this help? Well, because from the outside, not really understanding, and Ali's helped me understand. I think I've got a picture in my mind, but I want you to clarify it. Why, why won't people now just? Just do two pounds fifty times instead of a hundred pounds. Do you see what I mean? Because, but a compulsive gambler can't bet two pounds. He's got, you know, he's got to, he's got to win. He's got to win a, if he puts in a hundred, he's got to win a thousand pounds. He can't win seven pounds. It's no good to him. Okay, so. What, but then, what will I'm not saying, your, will the people you're helping not go out and just do something else in pursuit of a bigger hit? Absolutely, absolutely not. Oh. Because those machines are. They're death traps, to be honest with you, honestly, James. And, I, I believe you. Know, you. And do you know I why I believe you? No. Wonga. Absolutely. I just, uh, that was a real lesson for me in what these people will do to take money off the poor and government will allow until the problem becomes so immense that even a Conservative government has to take steps. So these machines have been designed to rinse people who can least afford it. Yeah, just one more thing. Just Go on, Barry. I'm late for the news. I feel bad now about telling you to hurry just up. Just the, just the last thing. Go on. Wonga, you've just hit on it. All these people have taken payday loans and put themselves into so much trouble. Yeah, and believe it. And congratulations, I guess, to you, because uh, I sense you've contributed to this campaign. So you've heard from Barry and Ali, who've been at the coalface of the particular problem. If you do find yourself, and, and I'm going to say lazily, that may be unfair, being lazily seduced by talk of nanny states and big government and too much, I mean, paused a little, I hope, this morning to wonder what the hell it is that you're actually supposed to be getting cross about. Government policy designed to make people healthier and happier. Ooh, down with that sort of thing. I should clarify, I'm not suggesting for a moment that this government is routinely dedicated to making the population healthier and happier. Quite the opposite, it would often seem. Um, But in the context of reducing the maximum stake you can place on a fixed odds betting terminal, they have done absolutely the right thing. The, the, The slightly broader question it poses that we're trying to answer today is, where does this... Um, this weird anger come from. Um, Usually, and this is true of so much that's evil in our world today, it's usually perpetrated and disseminated by extremely wealthy people, and it's designed to make much, much poorer people blame the wrong target for their problems. So, nanny state, health and safety, human rights, immigration, Muslims, whatever it might be, all of it, especially now we're learning more about the um, billionaire Robert Mercer in America and his influence over fake news sites like Breitbart and the um, uh, Cambridge Analytica outfit. Literally, some of the richest men in the world trying to persuade some of the poorest people in the civilised world that their problems are caused by... Well, make the list. Practically the chapter list make the list. What what are the problems of these poor people caused by, according to extremely rich and secretive billionaires who control the media? Answer, well, nanny state, immigration, uh, health and safety, human rights. Um, What else is responsible for all of our problems? Lefties, well, trades unions. I mean, think about it. It's surreal, isn't it? Trades unions are responsible for the fact that you're losing your, your protections in the workplace? Trades unions are the reason why your wages are going down? No, 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 that's immigrants. Yeah, but if you were all in a trade union... Yeah, you see? So I see the fixed odds betting terminal story, and oddly... And then I see the rhetoric punted out by some of the weird right-wing think tanks that get treated with respect by programmes that have much lower standards than this one. And I find myself thinking, hang on a minute, why? Why would an ordinary person be cross that the government has decided to minimise the amount of self-harm that a gambling addict can do. Why would you be cross about that? Because I've sold you the idea that you're being persecuted. I've managed to persuade you that you're a victim. We live in a society now in the Western world where straight white men think that they're oppressed. That's how supremely successful this mission has been by hate preachers and demagogues to persuade people, privileged people, that they're victims and that the culprits... The people responsible for their victimhood are women 
and gay people and black people and immigrants and foreign people. It's quite an incredible coup that's been pulled off in the shadows. Quite incredible. But I, I just occasionally, I suppose you could say I dedicate my professional life to asking people just to pause and ask themselves what they're actually angry about. And in the context of fixed, fixed odds betting terminals or indeed of the ban on junk food on, on London transport and elsewhere, you can't tell me what you're angry about. You can just repeat the platitude that the extremely corrupt billionaire-backed rhetoric has supplied you with. Oh, I want my country back. Oh, we control our borders and our money and our laws. Oh, um, it's the nanny state. Oh, it's political correctness gone mad. You can, I mean, this is why so many of our clips go viral on the program, because people can say the words, ask them what they mean by the words, and it all goes horribly, horribly, horribly wrong. 10.38 is the time. Maybe that's why so many people are listening to the program. No one else is asking these questions. Everyone else is telling you to be angry. We're just asking what you're angry about. Ross is in Chiswick, God's own country. Ross, what would you like to say? Hi, good morning. Thank you for taking the call. Very well. Um, primarily, I just want to say that I, I completely agree with your points about kind of government responsibility and protecting... Where, do, where does the society. disagreement come from, do you think? Uh, Gary Burton writes, it's when we're most angry with ourselves that we direct our anger at others. So I guess the susceptibility to this commoditization of rage is going to be determined by how much you love or hate yourself. But, but why, why would people not stop to ask? Why am I angry about this, for example, or that? I don't know. And it, 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 to be honest, it seems to me that um, the, the people that get angry about this kind of thing are the people that are least affected. It's the same about yes. people that get angry about, you know, uh, transgender bathrooms in American schools. <laughs> yes, um, it is, isn't it? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. But um, the, the, the point that I want to make Carry today on. is that um, I, I think actually, you know, kind of individual protection from the government here is, is kind of actually only half the story. Yeah. Um, to give a little bit of context, I, I work in the field of anti-money laundering, and up until January, I work in gambling anti-money laundering. Um, and I, I think actually this move is, is probably looking a little bit more long-term at, at, at wider crime prevention. I mean, it's obviously it's, it's well documented the links between gambling addiction and criminality. Yes. Um, and, and also, it's, it's quite widely accepted that fixed or betting terminals are particularly addictive. So, kind of anecdotally, at least, what I would say is that fixed odds betting terminals have, have led to an increase in gambling-related criminal activity, for example, stealing from your employer to fund oh, your gambling. Goes, goes without saying. I've just heard from someone who used to work in a bookmakers that would routinely see people break down in tears after putting their rent into a machine. Um, so you have to ask yourself, how did they pay their rent that month? Exactly. I mean, the, the fact that on a FOBT, you can, up until today, you could pump in £100 every two minutes, meaning that within the hour, you've put in... What, was three, three grand, yeah. thirty grand. Um, that's that's huge amounts of sums for people to routinely be coming back and putting that money in again and again and again, and it's astronomically high above the national, you know, average income. So you do have to ask the question of where does this money come yes, from? And I think yes, it, You know, you have to understand the context of kind of gambling regulation at, at this point in time, and anti-money laundering is a particular focus of the Gambling Commission, who regulate gambling in the UK. Um, and I think the Gambling Commission will have kind of fed this line more and more into the government, and that, that's probably where a lot of this has come from. Um, I, I do actually think that this is a, this is a really sensible move on, on both counts, both on the individual protection and protecting the most vulnerable in society, but also in terms of a longer-term crime prevention um, across society, making sure that if, you know, it's impossible to spend such high sums, people won't get addicted to such a high level at, at losing such high stakes and therefore won't need to steal to fund the addiction. So it's, a, it's um, psychological reprogramming then, or, or, I mean, that sounds a bit Orwellian. We could call it uh, psychological help. <laughs> it's, it's psychological, but it's also, it's very pragmatic. It's a very practical step. If you can only lose, you know, a few hundred pounds a day, that becomes much more affordable and so, you know, if, if you're someone who struggles with a gambling addiction and can lose tens of thousands of pounds a day, people will lose that much and won't have the money to lose so, it. So what, and will have to resort to other means. Yeah, but you see, I, I mean, there's a danger that we're all kind of um, on the same page on this because I suspect people who thought they were angry about this have now listened to the programme and either turned it off because they're determined to stay angry or realise that they shouldn't be angry at all. Where does even the phrase nanny state come into this? You're, you're, you're effectively describing people who, for whatever reason, have proved unable to stop themselves from punching themselves in the face every day. And the government has essentially tied one of their arms behind their back, and people are cross. Because as you say, either you're affected by it or you're not. And if you're affected by it, this can only be good news. 
to be honest, I think the only people that have a legitimate right to be angry about this kind of thing are the people that lose tens of thousands Money. of pounds a day, can legitimately afford to lose tens of thousands of pounds a day, uh, and enjoy losing tens of thousands of pounds uh, a day. And that's a very small Venn diagram of people that can do it and enjoy losing that much money. And if that's what they enjoy doing, we'll set fire to £50 notes because it doesn't make sense. It has the same end game, although the, the, the process is probably different emotionally. And, and they, they are more likely, are they not, to be sitting in, a, in, in, in Monte Carlo than they are to be pumping money into a machine in the back streets of, of South London? Absolutely, yeah. Ross, what are you doing now if you've moved on? If you don't mind me asking, you're obviously a, 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 a very interesting person. If you've moved on from the betting side of things, you're still in the money laundering sector. Sure. Um, well, I... Uh, I'm don't want between to jobs me. at the minute. I, I, I left. I left the, the gambling world. I, I did a little bit of consultancy work, but oh, in cool. July, I'm actually uh, I'm moving out to Luxembourg to work for a, a very small kind of financial services firm. Again, doing um, anti-money laundering and oh. compliance work around that kind of thing, making sure that I can get over to the EU before yeah. it becomes impossible. Mm, well, we, yeah, well, good luck. Keep in touch. Promise me you'll keep listening. Certainly will. Absolutely. Yeah. And although I, I look, a lot of people pointing out that they listen from overseas, so they're not included in the. Uh, in the current audience figures. My undoc I'm going to call you my undocumented listeners. 0345 is the number you need if you want to contribute to this question. The, um, I mean, he really knew his stuff, didn't he? And, and then we're left again just wondering, as I'm sure the people who are persuaded to be furious every day are wondering now, what am I actually cross about? What am I cross about? How have I ended up thinking, as a, a, as a straight white man, that I'm somehow part of a persecuted group? What? what? What day is it? Radical feminists are taking over the world. The government is interfering in my freedoms because it will not let me put several thousand pounds that I haven't got into a machine every day. Strange times we live in. Um, Tend is quite fun chronicling them, I suppose. 10.45 is the time, Dee, where we are examining the scourge of fixed odds betting terminals, but also trying to get into the question of, of, of why it's so successful, this, this sort of mission to blame any attempt to make the world a better place, to, to turn it into a negative. You know, social justice warriors is an insult. Virtue signalling is an insult that's aimed at people who try to do the right thing in life, you know? M m morality, almost, is being maligned on, a, on an industrial scale. And so when a government does something that is designed to protect people from hurting themselves and actually, possibly more pertinently, hurting their families, because, you know... Uh, <laughs> It's a dad or a mum often that's pumping the money into these machines. How can that be a bad thing? Unless, of course, you're looking at the world through the lens of a, of a mysteriously funded right-wing think tank or a, quote, media, end quotes, organisation bankrolled by shady billionaires. 03456060973. Brian knows what I'm talking about. He says there has to be somebody to shift the blame on to, James, which is why the likes of the Daily Mail have rubbish like this on their front pages on a daily basis. Once you're part of the cult of such a paper or fake news site, you can feed them anything and they will still follow you. Uh, George is in Redbridge. George, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi, James. Hello. Um Basically, I mean, I think it's all nonsense with this fixed dot betting terminal cap in it because if the government really did care and they're doing it because they cared, they would do it across the board. I mean, there's nothing stopping me now going on the internet, going on to Ladbrokes, going on to Skybet, Bet365, going on to their roulette... No, but you, you, you've listened to the people who've explained what is different about the fixed odds betting, I mean, profoundly different about the fixed odds betting title. Well, I play both of them, and there is no difference, James. You can stand in front of them. But then you're not addicted. On the computer. No, I'm not addicted. So everyone that has become addicted to them has explained the psychological difference, and, and you're, you're welcome not to recognise that, but you can't call them all liars. Well, no, but the difference is, have they sat on the internet and played roulette on the internet? They probably haven't. They probably don't know they can do that yet. But you, you can't lose way. as much money as quickly in any other way. You can. You right. really can. All right. So you, you want them to? So you play both, and you want them to ban everything? Well, no. I'm saying if they're going to ban it, they should ban it across the board because they're basically they're saying, okay, you don't go in the betting office and do it, but you can go and sit on the behind a computer and do it. Same as a casino. You can go into a casino and they've got the fixed betting yes, terminal. But again, well. I, I, the neuropsychological design of these machines, as is explained by every single addict that we've ever spoken to on the program, is quite unique. And you are arguing either that you want the government to ban even more stuff, or you're arguing from a very silly position, which is they've done something, but they haven't done everything, therefore they should have done nothing. So which is it? Well, no, the, what they really should have done is the right thing. So you want them to the ban right. everything? 
Well, no, obviously you can't ban everything because of the uproar. It's so what would the right smoking. thing be, why then? Ban, well, let's start saying, why ban smoking indoors? Yes, that's a question, not an answer. Well, what, what should but they? What would the right simple. thing be? Well, the right thing to be would clearly to say to people we to let them do what they want because people would make their own minds up. So you don't want them to ban, you don't want them to make any measures at all to protect no, people. But the measures that they should be putting in place isn't banning them. It should be getting these people spending enough money, and this is what it comes down to. They're not prepared. To but they haven't them. banned them, have they? They've reduced the amount of money that people can spend, so they've done exactly what you've just said they should have done. But the problem is that people are still going to be. Well, you need to stop and listen to what I'm saying before you respond, otherwise you fall into holes like that. They have reduced yeah, the amount of money you can spend, which is what you just said they should have done. Yeah, and you're talking again without listening, too. mate. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, because at the end of the day, there's no difference between standing behind the machine in a betting office. It's Except that all of the addicts up. say that there's a massive difference and all of the psychological uh, research supports them. So, so I'll ask you again for the final time, are you saying that they didn't do everything so they shouldn't have done something or are you saying that they should have done everything and banned everything? No, they should have done more. This right, so I'm you saying. want more bans? banning more. No, not banning. No, if you listen to what I'm saying, I'm not saying they should ban more. They should put more investment into people with gambling problems to get help. I mean, you take... It's another example with our government and why they're useless at the end of the day, because they... they I can they, they, they've taken a £100 maximum stake and reduced it by a factor of £50 pounds. to £2. Pounds. Yeah. So yeah. you're perfectly entitled to think that they're useless, but that, to me, is... is so a you, but, what, what, no, you're off again, mate. Yeah, Go on. I'll tell you what, you keep days. talking, all right, and I'll have a word with Sam in Hay. Sam, what would you like to say? Hello. Hello, Sam. What's on your mind? Hi, James. Uh, I'm, I'm your regular listener, and I really like your program. You, so, you're uh, very really welcome. Glad that you brought this issue this morning. Hello. It's your turn, mate. Over to you. See, the last caller couldn't listen, and you, 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 you can't, you can't talk. I'm caught between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> what do you want to say? Right, what do you want to say? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really like the news this morning, but I heard that the government has actually brought down this stack to two pounds from hundred pounds. Why? Um, well, I mean. I, I I was working for a betting company, you know, for about seven years, and obviously you can you could see people losing incredible amount of money every day. But why don't they just and, now? Uh, go, they can go and do that online, can't they? Why 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 does reducing the amount of money that you can put into these particular machines cause such problems? Well, yeah, I agree with you. But what we need to understand is there are restrictions available online as well. One can self exclude themselves from online accounts, and online activities are constantly monitored by the betting industry so on the in the shop you know you don't really get uh, noticed if you lose an incredible amount of money so they are regulated and controlled in completely different ways these two modes of gambling um yeah pretty much yeah yes, i mean okay. in the shop, just to know, clarify keeps changing and you don't know if the customer has actually lost have you worked yeah. in a bookmaker's shop Yes. And what is the worst thing you've witnessed in the context of a fixed odds betting terminal? Well, people breaking the machines, number one, and, you know, getting stressed out, and they've lost their house, their families, and stuff like that. They've, you know, they've, they've lost pretty much everything, and, and job, uh, and everything. Just, just, again, to reiterate the point, as an observer of gamblers and gambling... modes in which people can lose money all the other ways in which people can lose this money is so fast this is so fast and what what happens is you, you you have a screen in front of you the big screen where you can actually see the ball rolling around and you feel like it's actually live like in casinos so you, you get that kind of you know intimidation and uh, you, you you just want to chase your losses that you made previously so you're not winning actually but you're changing your loss so it's it, what it is if i've understood it correctly it's the way in which you very very casually increase your stake to recoup your losses until you reach a point where you're yeah. you're losing yeah, you, buy, you know you're going to come back next day and we we see every day pretty much same customers like regulars and also strangers coming in and around, and they go to different betting shops in the high street anyway, so it's not just one... And there's not a lot you can do to stop people, it's the ease of access yeah, to mean, such a toxic... To honest, they look, exactly, I mean, to be honest with you, look, a lot of betting industries, they've got, you know, they, they've trained their staff, they've, they've spent an incredible amount of money on training staff and, you know, um, uh, conducting RGIs in the shops, which is called Responsible and Gambling Interactions. Mm. But, uh, it's down to the self, you know, if the person is not actually controlling themselves and uh, it, it's nothing going to happen. Um, but this, this rule will certainly help and assist everybody uh, who have been in this uh, gambling addiction for a long period of time.
And that can only be a good thing. Um, I, I suppose, as we've heard, there are positions that you could describe as dissenting, although they're pretty impenetrable. Daniel is in... Uh, Sam, thank you very much. Daniel's in New Crossgate. Daniel, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello, Daniel. Um, the notion that, uh, that some people say that new law would curtail their freedom, actually, that needs to be thought about because what the state actually does, we have these forces of the gambling industry with billions of dollars, and the state creates actually a space by the law it makes for everybody to have space and freedom and equality to actually be what they are. This, uh, gambling doesn't affect me, but there's a lot of people who, who, it do, I mean, who, who it does affect. And they are not as strong to withhold all that advertising. Stuff. But that, that's so the thing, need... isn't it? That's, the, that's where it gets... I, that's where I think I begin to understand the kind of... Uh, people who call themselves classical libertarians or whatever the phrase of the week is at the moment, they sort of think, well, if you can't help yourself, if you can't control yourself, why should I... I mean, my money want taxes me? Do you, do, you, do you see... I can't quite put it into words because I'm not an idiot, but if I was an idiot, I'd be saying something like, why should I be paying for you to be something different helped? Because that is exactly what the society asks through the state actually do. Well, that's we what I thought. Laws. Yes. We create laws to protect, to actually create through infrastructure laws a space of equality and freedom for everybody. Oh, bless you. And, You've restored my faith in human nature, Daniel. And, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I know it's sad, but... No, you have. James, and, you know, and some people might argue with me and say, oh, that's just a fantasy thing. I say, look at the great, the three great ideals from the French revolution liberté égalité and fraternity <sighs> freedoms now, brotherhood equality yeah ah, so happy and, days. but the trouble is the trouble is we haven't really thought about as society where to in which area of our side to apply these great principles and it's quite clear this e equality is a thing of our society in the right sphere. In the right sphere, we ought to have equality so everybody is equal. In the cultural sphere, we have to have freedom. The cultural sphere is art, education, religion. Everybody has its own freedom to do, to believe, to be educated. We have all different... But does this not take away... I mean, you could argue that this takes away a freedom. Do I not have a freedom to, to, to pump all my money into a machine or to waste all my money on gambling? That, that's a freedom, in a sense, a negative freedom, but a freedom nonetheless. I, I myself have a freedom to do that. You yes. do. But am I really free? Or am I bebuzzled by all this advertising? And the, you know, the amount of neuropsychological uh, research that has gone into creating these machines and these, these games that are designed both... I mean, it's a bit like the kind of weaponization of the bells and whistles that used to draw us to the fruit machine in the corner of the pub. 0345 60609. Daniel, thank you. 973. This is it. You're right. It does sound a bit like the uh, American guns argument. Why should my freedom to gamble loads be lost because other people can't afford it? Uh, that is what a, a kind of criticism of this decision would would look like. Last word on that uh, fixed odds betting terminals, although the, the news agenda being what it is at the moment, I wouldn't be surprised if we return to it in the course of the day on LBC, but this is from Anonymous in Kent, and you will see why. I welcome this move, James, and any move to keep a population happy and healthy. These machines have destroyed my family through my father's addiction. It's left me £17,000 in debt as he couldn't help with my veterinary degree and associated training. But more importantly, I've barely spoken to him for 10 years, not because I don't want to, but because he spiralled into the depression and will not communicate with me. I know he listens to this show and I hope he is listening, so he knows I am still here and I still love him. I do miss time. Stop!